we just thank God for all that the Lord has done for us. So, so many wonderful things God has done, far more than our tongues can tell. And this morning, if you listen to the words that you say, bless thy church, Lord, thy church. Because the topic today is the church. Our scripture reading which I read, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, we are a chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation. Father in heaven, we invite the presence of thy Holy Spirit to be with us now to be our teacher, open our dark understanding, and as we understand, help us to apply them to our daily lives. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for answering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Many times we say, I'm going to church today. I'm going to West Bromwich, I'm going to Dudley, I'm going to Jimmy K, uh, wherever, wherever. But, the church building is a landmark. It's like any other building, such as the Tower of London, Big Ben, courthouses, etc. But it's not a church. This is a building. Who is the church then? We are the church. The church is a group of Christians who meet together to worship God. It is a divinely created fellowship of sinners who trust a common savior and are one with each other because they are all one with him through the Holy Spirit. The church therefore is a called out people by God from the world to be the people who belong to God in a very special way, who owe their, exi their existence and their corporate distinctiveness from other communities to one thing only, and that is to the call of God. The church is never a place, but always a people. Never a fold, but always a flock. Never a sacred building, but always a believing assembly. That's the church. A structure of brick and marble can be no more a church than your clothes of serge or satin can be you. There is in this world nothing but man, no sanctuary of God but the soul. The church is you and me who pray, not where we pray. The church was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to all the world as it says in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I will be with you always unto the end of the world. So from the beginning, it was God's plan that through the church, His fullness and His sufficiency would be reflected to the world through you and through me. If Christians are not in that kind of fellowship with one another, they are falling short of God's plan for his church. We may be keeping the Sabbath and going to church, but if we are not in genuine fellowship, we are not actually experiencing God's corrupt definition of church to the fullest extent. What then is the church's foundation? The answer is love. As it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So thus Christ is the foundation and the head of the church on earth. That is, his people who loves him and keep his commandments as he kept his father's commandments and abide in his love. The church is constituted by the action of God who calls the people out of darkness into his marvelous light. It is God's gracious action that calls the church together makes it possible. In a sense then, human history is really his story. The story of the great calling 
unto himself a people who will bear his name and live his life upon the earth. John 15 verse 16 and 17 says, Ye are not, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. And in verse 17 he says, these things I command you, that he love one another. Without love, it is impossible to please God. How can we say we love God and yet have enmity in our hearts for each other? Jesus says, I love you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you to me. Where then? To who and when and where did God's church begin? The answer in the Garden of Eden, as found in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, and Exodus 21 to 18, shows its continuation and will continue in the earth made new throughout all eternity. Revelation 22, 14 and 15, and 18, 19. Now, when Christ came, this Old Testament concept was fulfilled, not destroyed. Christ is the mediator of the covenant. Through his atoning death, believing Jews and Gentiles formed the people of God on earth. 1 Peter 2, 9, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, as we read. Now for this purpose will he return and gather to himself an eternal community. Matthew 24, verse 31. Matthew 24, verse 31 tells us there what he says. Matthew 24, verse 31. It says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. He is coming to gather his children home. There are some Christians who see the Christian faith primarily, if not exclusively, as the gospel of Jesus and me. God called Abraham with the promise of the multiplicity of as numerous as the sand on the seashore or as the stars of heaven. Jacob, whose twelve sons became the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, the name God gave to Jacob. God's people rejected his role, broken his covenant, and thus lived into captivity. But God brought them back from Egypt, as it says in Jeremiah 16, verse 15. He said, it is God's gracious action that calls the church together, makes it possible. Without God, it would be impossible. The New Testament church has Abraham as its father, Jerusalem as its mother, and place of worship as Hebrews 12, 22. Now, if you can remember these, Romans 4, 11 and 16, Abraham as the father, because remember, his seed would be like what? The suns on the shore and the stars of heaven, you see. The place of Peter describes it again as a, you know, we are a chosen generation, calls on those. So Christianity is simply a personal relationship with Jesus. Accept Christ in our life and we will be saved. Although we are justified through faith, Christianity is much more than just a private transaction with Jesus. He is in the midst to bless and to do us good. The church is to be the physical representation of Christ in the world. Indeed, his body since the resurrection. What Christ said, the church will say. And what he did, the church will do also. And greater works that I do, Jesus declared, the church will do. John 14, 12. The church, as we said, has one foundation. It is Jesus Christ our Lord. God has called his church in his day, as he called ancient Israel, 
to stand as a light in the earth by the mighty cleaver of truth. The messages of the first, second, and third angels. God has called his people out, separated them from the world to bring them into sacredness to himself. He has made them depositories of his law and committed to them the great truths of prophecy for the time to be communicated to the world. The time came when he said to his disciples, Go ye therefore, teach all nations. Christ declares to his followers, he said, Ye are the light of the world. To every soul that accepts Jesus, the cross of Calvary speaks. He said, Behold the words of the soul. There are tares among the wheat. Will thou then that we gather them up? Was the question asked by the servant? But the master assured him, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, ye uproot also the wheat with them. The gospel net draws not only good fish, but bad ones as well. And only the Lord knows who are his. Go ye into all the world. Judgment has come. Nothing is to be permitted to hinder this work. It's the all-important work for the time. It is to be far-reaching as eternity. The love that Jesus manifested for the souls of men in the sacrifice which he made for their redemption will actuate all his followers. The sin that controlled the world has come into the hearts of those who claim to be God's peculiar people. It is our individual duty to walk humbly with God. Although there are evils existing in the church and will be until the end of the world, the church in these last days is to be the light of the world that is polluted and demoralized by sin. The more we exercise our powers for the master, the more apt and skilled we will become. The more closely we connect ourselves with the source of light and power, the greater light will be shed upon us and the greater power will be ours to use for God. God will not make men and women channels of light while they are still in darkness and are content to remain so, making no special efforts to connect with the source of light. Old habits and customs must be shaken off, and it's only by earnest, persevering prayer and action we receive divine aid. Remember that our responsibility is measured not by our present resources and capacities, but by the powers originally bestowed and the possibilities for improvement. Everyone who connects himself with the church makes in that act a solemn vow to work for the interest of souls above every worldly consideration. It is our work to preserve a living connection with God to engage with heart and soul in the great scheme of redemption and to show in our life and character the excellency and God's commandments in contrast with the customs and precepts of the world. Christ expects every man to do his duty. Let this be the watch word throughout the ranks of his followers. We are not to wait to be solicited to give light, to be important for counsel or instruction. Everyone who receives the rays of the sun of righteousness is to reflect its brightness to all about him. His prayers and entreaties should be so imbued with the Holy Spirit that they will melt and subdue the soul. What is said? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and be led to glorify your Father in heaven. 
because of the solidity of God's love, he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own finger on two tables of stone, and he gave them to Moses to read to the children of Israel. The first four pointed to God. As Luke 6, 5 says, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And Mark 7, 27, 28 says, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Well then, was that day changed by God? Let's hear what Paul says in Hebrews 4, verses 4 and 8. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 and 8. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And verse 8, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? That they had not been changed at all. Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Revelation 14, 6 to 12 calls it the everlasting gospel. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. From beginning right unto the end it will be. And chapter 3, 20 and 22 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Know your gift and work upon it, and God will bless and multiply it in abundance. Souls in darkness must be warned and make their decision one way or the other. If all professed children of God would feel that it is the, the, chief, the chief business of life to do the work which he has bidden us to do, what a change would be seen in hearts and homes and in the world itself. The man with the one talent is not to bury that in the earth. God has given to every man his work according to his ability. Men with one talent may reach a class that those with two or five cannot approach. Great and small alike are chosen vessels to bear the water of life to thirsting souls. Eternity stretches before us. The curtains are about to be lifted. While Jesus was here, he worked to save and bless the lost. If we are Christians, we will imitate his example. Knowing the time that it's now high time to awake out of sleep, for our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. Every day that passes by brings us nearer. Sons of God and daughters, beloved in Jesus, O oh, wondrous words of grace, in his Son the Father sees us, and as sons he gives us peace. We are to allow ourselves to be built into a spiritual house. The metaphor of a newborn baby is individualistic. It's individual. Each child takes taking his milk and growing up, but each living stone is firmly attached to the stone above it, beneath it, and beside it. No stone is suspended in mid-air. Thus, the baby metaphor speak to us of the necessity of growth. The stone metaphor speaks of the necessity of fellowship. The people of God urgently need better quality mortar. Too often the mortar crumbles and the stones fall away until the building itself seems in danger of collapsing. What it says, united we stand, Divided we fall. If the chosen is ever to draw people to itself and so to Christ, it will do so only 
by the almost irresistible magnetism of a loving fellowship. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. 1 John 3, 14. This love will govern every facet of our relationships in the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christians. Our attitudes and actions will not be dictated by worldly prejudices nor by the instincts of our nature, but by that divinely implanted love which views every believer in Christ as a brother or sister in the family of God. We are redeemed by his blood. We are justified by his resurrection and we are indwelt by his Holy Spirit. What the world seeks today Christians claim to have found. Whenever Christians gather together in the name of Jesus, he stands among them. Only a worshiping church can be an evangelizing church because only a church that knows Christ can make him known to witnesses. In Isaiah 42, 6, it says, We are a light to the nations to publish the truth of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. He has enlightened us, adopted us, had mercy on us. How can we keep these things to ourselves? Romans 13, 11 to 13. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their lands. Second Chronicles 7, 14. God is ready and willing to pour out his spirit. But revival requires 100% surrender to God on our part. 100%. That is why in God's message to the Laodiceans, he counsels them to buy of him gold tried in the fire that they may be rich. We buy by giving ourselves unreservedly to God. If we want to make the devil tremble, begin earnestly to seek God for revival. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing every hindrance so the Lord can pour out his spirit upon the languishing church and an impenitent congregation. We are living in an age of spiritual darkness. Multitudes are enslaved by sinful customs and evil habits, and the fetters that bind them are difficult to break. Iniquity, like a flood, is deluding the earth. Crimes almost too fearful to be mentioned are of daily occurrence and yet men professing to be watchmen at the walls of Zion will teach that the law was designed only for the Jews and passed away with the glorious privilege or privileges that ushered in the gospel age. Is there not a relationship between the prevailing lawlessness and crime and the fact that ministers and people hold on and teach that the law is no longer a binding force? God has left to every man his work. Everyone has a part to act, and he cannot neglect the work except at the peril of their souls. Let us awake out of sleep. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. Let the people of God arise, repent of her backslidings before God. Let the watchman awake and give the trumpet a certain sound. It is a definite warning that we have to proclaim. The world must be warned. What are we doing as individuals to bring the light before others? God commands his servants Cry aloud, 
Spare not, lift up their voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Amen. Isaiah 58, 1. The attention of the people must be gained. Unless this can be done, all effort is useless. Though an angel from heaven should come down and speak to them, his words would do no more good than if he was speaking into the cold air of death. <coughs> the light that with shining clear and distinct rays will grow dim amid the moral darkness. The aggressive power of the truth of God is dependent upon the cooperation of the human agent with God in piety, in zeal, in unselfish efforts to get the light of truth before others. Brothers and sisters, will we grieve the Holy Spirit and cause him to depart? Will we shut out the blessed Savior because we are unprepared for his presence? Are we willing to surrender all to God? and by of him, by giving 100% of ourselves. That is what it will take to experience revival in our lives and be part of the great revival <coughs> that will soon take place among God's people. Will we leave souls to perish without the knowledge of the truth? Because we love our ease too well to bear the burden that Jesus bore for us? It is not he that puts it on the armor that can boast of the victory, for he has a battle to fight and a victory to win. It is he that endureth unto the end that shall be saved. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto his chosen people. We are God's house of living stones built for his own habitation. He fills our hearts, his humble thrones granting us life and salvation. Where two or three to seek his face, he in their midst will show his grace, blessings upon them bestowing. Yet in this house and earthly frame, Jesus, his children, his blessing, hither we come to praise his name, faith in our Savior confessing. Jesus to us, his Spirit sent, making with us his covenant, granting his children the kingdom. Through all the passing years, O oh Lord, grant that when church bells are ringing, many may come to hear God's word, where this, where this promise is bringing, I know my own, my own know me. You, not the world, my face shall see. My peace, I live with you. Amen. 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 Amen.